Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Before we get started, I must tell you, um, my voice is going out. I'm okay. I'm not sick or anything. I just overdid it doing some character work. So in this video, you're going to hear me start out strong, and then <laughs> this is going to happen. Um, so bear with me on that. Thank you. And the only reason I'm putting the video out, of course, is because i got to work, and I also need to bring you your dose of vocal melatonin. So, if this is your first time here, I'm sorry. I don't ever sound like this, but please uh, just show your support. Or if you've been here already, please show uh, support if you haven't. Hit that subscribe button, and right next to it is the bell. Make sure it's set to on so you can always know when I upload a video. With that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for the your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. Right after the first story, an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, and by the way, if you hear my voice going in and out, that's because I'm slowly losing my voice because I was doing character work and I think I just shredded some vocals, I think. So please forgive me for that. And no, don't worry, I'm not sick. It's just my voice goes out when I'm pushing myself too hard. Knowing damn good and well, I know better. <laughs> Anyway, let's get back to the stories. This experience happened about four or five years ago on a very hot summer night in a small town in the Midwest. My friend and I are hanging out one night really late when we decided we wanted some IHOP mostly because it is the only 24-hour restaurant in the town, and it was 4 a.m. So, I drive us there. On the ride, we were super goofy, because I think we were a little too tired, and the idea of pancakes, you know. All mirth is drained as we pull into the parking lot and see and hear a group of about seven men approaching the IHOP on foot. Our windows were down because it was very hot, and my car didn't have A.C., so we furiously rolled them up and sat quietly to see what they were going to do. I can't explain why we were so immediately scared. Probably just some drunk guys wanting to get pancakes, right? Either way, we wait to gauge the situation instead of leaving the car to go inside. The men are obviously plastered drunk. Another detail is this IHOP is off the highway and quite far from the residential areas and bars, so they would have had to have walked quite a ways from the closest bar to get there. Anyway, we are paralyzed just watching them, hoping they didn't notice us in the car. They did. They start shouting and walking towards us. We lock the doors. They are banging on the window, shouting unintelligible drunken things. I turned the keys in the ignition and started to drive off. They ran after us. They chased us on foot, screaming obscenities, before we lost sight of them in the distance after about a quarter of a mile. It seemed bizarre to me. Obviously, they weren't going to catch us, but they futilely ran after us for that long. I don't know. Must have been the alcohol, but it scared the shit out of us. I think they must have been out-of-towners staying at a hotel, since there are several relatively close to the IHOP. That would make more sense than them walking there all the way from town. Luckily, that means we should likely never have another run-in with these guys. I'm a 35-year-old female, and my story takes place when I was 15, but it feels like yesterday. 
It was the day that would change my innocent youth forever. I am from a little village in Ireland with a population of a few hundred. The nearest town is about 10 miles away. Growing up in rural Ireland was very idealistic. Summers were spent playing football with neighbors or going to the lake swimming till the sun went down. I was lucky that even though the population is small and the houses are far apart, my best friend's house was only down the road. So, during those summer months, Mary and I were inseparable. My friend and I grew up with lots of brothers and sisters in a safe village. We were given a lot of freedom, and sometimes we were gone all day and only came back before it got dark. As it was the mid-90s, we had no mobiles, but our moms knew we would be okay and look out for each other. One thing we liked to do during these summers, besides going to the lake and hanging out at each other's houses, was go down to town and have a look around in the shops. The easiest way to get to town was to hitchhike as there were no buses. Here in Ireland, we call it thumbing. Hardly anyone hitches now because most households have two cars and parents are a lot more protective. But back in the 80s and 90s, it was very common. Our parents were okay with it, but there were certain rules we had to follow. I am not entirely sure who came up with the rules, but I assume our parents did. Rule number one, never hitch alone. You must thumb with at least one or two friends. Number two, never take a lift if there are two or more men in the car, but two or more women is fine. Number three, never take a lift from anyone in a van. There could be guys hiding in the back or worse, ropes, blindfolds, etc. Number four, this is the most important rule. When a car stops to pick you up, always ask the driver where they are going first. If you tell them where you are going first, they could pretend they are going to that same place to lure you in. We were innocent but had common sense, so we followed the rules down to a T. At least we tried to. My friend Mary and I used to hitch once a week during the summer. We would go to town with a population of a few thousand and look around the shops, eat ice cream, and hang out. When we got a ride, we had to make small talk with the driver, and as two shy 15-year-olds, this bit sucked the most. To make it fair, we took turns sitting in the front and did most of the talking. One day, we spent a few hours in town. It was pretty uneventful, so we decided to thumb it back. At around 3 p.m., we went to the usually spot to hitch from. Just on the outskirts of the town, we were only waiting about five minutes when a white car pulled up. Before we could ask where he was going, he asked us first. My friend told him, and he said he was passing through our village on the way to another one. Rule number four, broken. But he seemed nice enough, and we just wanted to go home. It was my turn to sit in the front. The driver introduced himself as John a farmer, and was super friendly. He was dressed in a worn t-shirt with holes in it. He had tattered pants and smelled of cow shit. The car was full of bits of hay and was old and battered like the driver. He was about 60. He didn't have a wedding ring on. Don't ask me why, but I always noticed these things. About halfway between our town and our home village, he asked if we heard a noise. No, we replied. Oh, there it is again. Sounds like a banging noise, he said. I didn't hear anything, so I just sat quietly. I think it might be the exhaust pipe, he said. I'll have to pull in and have a look. He pulled up on a busy road and went out to take a look. I didn't hear anything, said Mary. He seems like a weirdo, I said. Call it intuition, but even though he was super friendly and chatty, I got a bad feeling from him. Next thing, he comes back to the driver's side and tells us that the exhaust is hanging down and was hitting off of the road. He needs us to help him tie it up. It was then I noticed he had string holding up his pants instead of a belt. 
I thought that was odd. Anyway, he got some string of the boot, same color strings as his belt, and we both got out of the car. Although I got a bad vibe from him, I didn't feel scared at this stage. We were on a busy road, and it was only about 3.30 p.m., so we both got out of the car. He showed us the exhaust pipe hanging down and used a rag to hold it up because it was hot. My friend Mary took over holding it up while he secured it with string. They were both kneeling while I just stood back and watched. It was then I noticed his fly was open and I could see his privates. He was clearly not wearing any underwear. He didn't even have a belt on, so I guess I wasn't surprised. In my head, I thought, Oh, fuck. What is going on? Oh, shit, shit, shit. But I didn't say anything. I just stood there in shock. Mary didn't notice at this stage and just continued to hold the pipe. When John was standing up, he noticed his fly was open and acted all shocked. Oh, <laughs> girls, I'm so sorry and embarrassed. I only have a safety pin holding the fly together and it must have come off. Please forgive me. Get back in the car. Mary was stunned because she got a close-up of his privates, which left me to do the talking. I told him it was okay and that it was an accident. So we both got in the car. He fastened the safety pin, even though I didn't see him look for it. All was hidden again. Back in the car, the atmosphere was very different. We both felt mortified, and he kept apologizing over and over. I looked out the passenger side window and repeated, It's okay, it's okay. Then he said something that turned my stomach. Well, girls, you're taking it very well. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear you liked it. Then he nudged me in the arm with his arm, like he would do a friend. I looked at him through the corner of my eye, and my face still facing the window when I noticed his fly was undone again and he was exposed again. He must have noticed me looking because he said, oh, oh, I'm sorry the safety pin keeps opening. Just don't look. Fine by me, I thought. And I said, okay, and continued to look out of the window. He kept nudging me and saying, don't be looking, don't be looking. <laughs> giggling at the same time. He was doing this in a playful way, like it was some kind of joke. Mary started giggling too, but when she is nervous, she laughs. I knew it wasn't her fault, but I was getting angry at the stage. He wouldn't stop telling me to stop looking. Then he said, Your friend is laughing. She must be enjoying the view. <laughs> this made her laugh even harder. Now remember, we are both polite 15-year-olds that always respects our elders and are a little shy, so I would never speak up to an adult. The nudging in my arm and my friend laughing was all getting too much. He asked, was it the first Willie I have ever seen, and told me once again to stop looking. I was turned facing the passenger side window, so much so that I had my back to him. There is no way I could be looking. I lost my temper. I shouted at the top of my voice. I'm not fucking looking. Mary, shut up fucking laughing. Silence followed. He said sorry, he was only joking, and I didn't need to be so serious. I said nothing and sat there red with temper. I should have told him to let us out. I should have told him to cover himself up, the dirty perv. But I was in shock, too. And part of me wanted to believe it was all an innocent mistake. We finally arrived at our tiny, safe little village. We got out, and he said again that he was sorry about the whole thing. My friend got her voice back and assured him it was okay. I said it was okay and not to worry about it. I said thanks for the lift. What he said back sickened me. He looked me up and down with this creepy smile and said, Girlies, thanks for everything, and drove off. 
We were left speechless. We sat down on a nearby bench to process all of this before going home. We made a deal we would not tell our parents or they never let us hitchhike again. My friend got back her voice and repeated, Pervert, sicko, smelly bastard. He had this plan the whole time. Over and over. About five minutes after sitting down on the bench, who drives by going the direction we just came from? Only pervert Farmer John waving and smiling while we sat stunned. He had beeped to catch our attention, so much for passing through our village. A few months later and the ordeal went to the back of my mind. Occasionally we would talk about Farmer John, but we made jokes about it and we told some of our friends about what happened. One day I told a friend of mine named Brid, a cousin of hers, and told her a very similar story. The cousins lived in another village about 20 miles the other direction from town. She was a few years older than us. While hitchhiking home one day, the same thing happened to her and her friend. The exhaust, the safety pin, and the undone fly. It was no accident, and my worst fears were confirmed. Farmer John really was a pervert. So, to the man who smells like cat shit, has worn clothes, and uses string to tie up his pants, and to the man who gets off on exposing himself to underage girls, I hope we never meet again and you end up in prison. This happened a few years ago. My aunt and uncle owned a restaurant, and one Saturday they were moving from their old location to the new one. My aunt, uncle, future husband, boyfriend at the time of course, cousin and about ten other people, mostly employees, were helping in the move since there was a bunch of large equipment. We were all at the old restaurant packing things, tying them down when we ran out of ratchet straps. I offered to drive to my parents' house, that was about 30 minutes away, to get more straps for my dad. Because everyone else was busy, I went alone. On the way back, I got a call from my aunt stating that they all were going to take a load to the new location and to meet them there. Since I didn't know how to get to the new place, I pulled over in a park to put in the address in my GPS. From the road, you weren't able to see the parking lot at all because of the trees. The only odd thing that I didn't notice at the time was that on this sunny weekend day, there were no cars in the parking lot. I pulled into a parking spot and immediately grabbed my phone to put in the address. For whatever reason, I didn't put it in park like I normally do, which unlocks the cars. Less than a minute after, I looked down. I heard and felt a huge hit to the car. I remember looking at him for so long. I thought it was odd how I couldn't see the color of his eyes because of how big his pupils were. It's important to note that I was in a small SUV and he had to bend over to look in the window. A second later, he was pulling the door handle so hard I thought he was going to tear it off. I was also confused why the door wasn't unlocked like it normally would be when I'm in a parking spot. He got visibly upset that the door wasn't opening, so he started banging on the side with his fists against the window, swinging his whole arm over and over. Getting progressively more pissed, he moved to the door handle of the back seat, and at this point I was so scared of him getting in the car. I grabbed and unsheathed the camping knife I had in my door. When I looked back at him, he stopped attacking the car, saw the knife, and smiled. I think it was right then that I realized that he did not want money. He didn't want to sexually assault me. He wanted to kill me. I knew that if he got in the car, it was going to be over for me, even with the knife. He was way bigger than me and hitting the car so hard, I was amazed that the windows held up. 
I guess I got comfortable with him not being able to get the doors open, but after bashing the back window a few more times, the car started rocking back and forth every time he moved the trunk. The panic got worse because I knew the doors weren't opening for some reason, but maybe the trunk would. Since it was an SUV, if he got in the trunk, he could just climb over the back seats and get to me. He hit against the back window with a bolt of his balled up in his fists and was yelling something I couldn't understand. Right then, I realized that I could slam it in reverse. I dropped the knife in my lap, hit the gear shift into reverse, grabbed the wheel, and put my foot down. I still have no idea if I hit him or if he jumped out of the way. I didn't look back. I put it in drive and peeled out of the parking lot. It was my first time ever ignoring the stop sign. I still have no idea why I didn't put it in park. We all make dumb decisions in life, but in this case, I was stupid. Very stupid. I arranged to meet a guy off Tinder, but because of my heightened anxiety about driving, I arranged for him to pick me up outside my place. I have been talking to him for a few weeks at least, but that is not redeemable and I know that. The choice I made on this day could have ended me, but thankfully, I'm still around to tell the tale. The guy picked me up in his car and told me he planned to take us out for sushi. I love sushi, so I thought, great. He put in the name of the restaurant into his GPS, and we were off, making pleasant conversation on the way there until, well, until I started seeing woods when I looked out of my window. I felt very confused. We were supposed to be going into town, not into the wilderness in the middle of nowhere. Fear hit me hard then. He said, I swear the GPS is taking me through here. I didn't choose this path. Please just get us back to civilization, I said. My eyes were wide, and I must have looked like a deer in headlights. His eyes were really apprehensive, so he must have known that I was scared, completely shitless. Oh my God, I thought to myself. I should have just conquered my anxiety about driving and meet him somewhere public. Or, better yet, not met with this guy at all. What the fuck was I thinking? I'm going to get murdered here in these woods. I tried checking my phone to see if I could assist with the GPS, and that's when he said those spine-chilling words. There's no signal out here. I remember just thinking to myself to try to look calm. Don't let him think you're upset. He's on to something. But man, did I feel terrified. The tips of my fingers were cold while I simultaneously was sweating. If he was going to kill me, part of me wanted him to get it over with, so I wouldn't be left in anticipation. His forehead was perspiring. He kept saying, I swear I I'm not doing this. I'm trying to get us back on route to the sushi place. I said, you know what? I don't care about sushi anymore. Get me to a gas station. Anywhere with people at this point. He said, I don't have a shovel or a weapon in my trunk or anything, if that's what you're thinking, which did little to calm my nerves. We finally made it to the restaurant after what felt like an eternity. I'd never been so scared in my life. I didn't have much of an appetite, and I was physically trembling when we arrived. But I figured he didn't kill me. When he had the chance, so I guess it was safe. Well, safe enough now to continue on with our date. I already planned on taking an Uber home because I didn't want to go through that experience again. I was shocked out of my mind when he then asked, So, when do you think we'll have sex? I nearly choked on a piece of sushi. What? 
I didn't know where this was coming from, and I didn't know how he could even ask me something like this now, on a first date at that, when we literally saw me pale as a ghost just moments ago. You know, like how long would you make me wait for sex? A day? A week? A month? I stared at him dumbfounded. I couldn't respond because I was utterly speechless in that moment. Well, I can't wait a whole month, I'm telling you now, he said. I didn't say anything, and the rest of the date was insanely awkward. I said goodbye as I took my Uber home, and only seconds after the driver pulled out of the restaurant parking lot, he texted me to say that he doesn't think it will work out with me because he needs a girl with a higher libido. I didn't argue. I just texted back a simple, okay, ready to be done with this man. When the Uber driver drove me home, he did not take me through the wilderness pathway of a potential murder site. He took me home through streets, other cars, lights, the sweetest scene in my immense relief. I couldn't help but wonder why my date had to take me through an hour drive through the wilderness just to get to the restaurant, but it only took the Uber driver 15 minutes to get me home from the same location. The whole thing was chilling. I don't know if my date planned on anything sinister or if it was an honest mistake, but I am glad I made it out alive. I learned a tough lesson that night. One that I should have already known, but that was foolishly ignored for some reason. Don't let strangers from a dating app pick you up in their cars. To the guy who took me through the woods, I don't ever want to talk to or see you again. Here's some background info. At the time of this story, I was eight or nine. I am a trans man, but very closeted at the time. I am Chinese. My family was going to Canada to see my family and Niagara Falls. I have random flashbacks to this incident, but I randomly had a nightmare yesterday about it. This is just to bring awareness that no matter how someone looks, they can be a creep. So, it was in the afternoon, and my father asked me to get the laundry for him down the street from our apartment. Get. <clears throat> I have crappy parents, so if I said no, then that would lead to severe consequences. He gave me a bag, and I left. I had no money or a phone, just a chocolate bar and a bag. I remember so clearly I was wearing a pink unicorn shirt with glitter and denim shorts. I was pretty tall for my age, but still pretty thin. The laundry mat was near a McDonald's. It has huge windows to see inside. I head inside, and it still had a while. I sat on the bench and ate my chocolate bar. This dude comes in with a backpack. He had a white tank top on and red shorts. I don't mind him and continue eating. I noticed he was staring at me for a while, but he can't possibly be bad. My mom said that bad people look like your stereotypical homeless person and just looks creepy. He was pretty good looking and fit, so he's probably not, and I'm just confused. He comes up to me and asks, where are your parents? I lied and said, they will be back soon. Better to be safe than sorry. He then stands a few feet away from me and says, I've never seen you. Are you a visitor? I tell him, no, my laundry machine at home is broken. Then he starts getting weird. He put his backpack down and I realized it's pretty empty. And I could see that this man is ripped. I put the chocolate bar away and I get up to check on the laundry and it has a few more minutes. He comes closer and asks me, Are you Asian? Like, there is no point in lying. Like, I look like a stereotypical Asian child. I nodded. The next lines I could still hear to this day. I love Asian women. 
They're so pretty. I want one for a wife. He reaches into his bag and pulls out some candy. Here, I see you like this. And he tried handing it to me. This I kind of messed up, and when my grandma babysits me, she watches shows where men gives women food or liquor. Woman consumes, she's then unconscious, and a man does whatever. So at this point, I'm starting to look for excuses to leave. I'm not making this up. I see a teen McDonald's employee standing outside eating. So I tell the guy, oh, let me ask my brother. I walk out, and the man is following me. The teen looks at me and puts down his sandwich. I try to be as innocent, but as straightforward as possible. I tell the teen, this man wants to give me candy. Should I take it? The teen looks at the man and then at me. I try to get him on the same page. Mom said not to take candy from a stranger, but he looks nice. The teen gets it and looks at the man. Yeah, she's not supposed to be having candy, but thank you, though. The man having no shame at all. Oh, you're her brother. Is she adopted? Here, take my number if you ever want her off your hands. And hands the teen a piece of paper. There's a crowd starting to form, so the guy leaves. The teen asks me if he should call the police. I convinced him not to because my parents will punish me. So the teen walks me to the laundry mat to get the clothes, tells me to come into the store with him. He explains to probably his manager. He gives the paper to the manager. The manager lets him leave so he can walk me home. I get to the street, and I tell him that it's my hotel. I thanked him and left. As I was walking back, he stood there the whole time, making sure I made it safely. To this day, I would like to think that they called the police after. I felt, and the man is now arrested. Thank you, Random McDonald's employee, for saving my life. To that creepy guy, I hope you're in jail. It's the mid-90s in rural Ohio. Children are free-range, smartphones are non-existent, and I am a quiet, shy fourth grader. The summer my mom became good friends with a couple who owned a large, beautiful flower farm. Most weekends, they would host friends and family for bonfires and s'mores. The adults would drink grown-up beverages, and the kids would explore and play. On the particular evening of this encounter, we had just settled in beside the fire when my mom stiffened beside me. She turned to me and said, I don't want you and your brother wandering off. Just play where I can see you. Now, this was unusual and kind of a bummer to my kid self, but she was regularly so lenient, but I begrudgingly went along with it. After our s'mores were eaten and before the sugar rush ensued, my mom gathered us together to wash our hands. Once again, this seemed odd. I was completely capable of using the restroom on my own, as was my younger brother. As we are rounding the corner to the house, we pass a man we had not previously met. My mother grabs both of our hands tightly and speed walks us to the back door, closing the screen door and locking the glass door behind her. In my memory, she was composed, but she later told me she felt breathless and panicked, like a wild-eyed animal. Not long after we hit the road to get home for bed and church the next morning, I remember thinking I wished we could stay and play longer or even camped her overnight like we sometimes did. But, oh well, my childhood did not connect anything odd but the whole situation. It would be many years later, when I was an adult, that my mother would tell me a story that I will never forget. She remembers all the same details, the bonfire, the s'mores, the sugared-up kiddos, and the sticky marshmallow hands. But... 
She also clearly remembers the sudden feeling of inescapable dread in the pit of her stomach and the heckles rising on the back of her neck. Even in front of the bonfire, her blood ran icy cold. She told me all she would think was, it's time to go, we need to get out of here. She said it was the most persistent feeling of urgency she's ever felt. She told me the next day at church, she asked her friend who the new man was at their home that night. He replied, that is my brother. He just got released from prison for child molestation and assault. He and I have never gotten along, but he has nowhere else to go. I asked him to go elsewhere for the evening, but he just showed up back at the house with no warning. I would never have allowed him near children. Her jaw almost dropped to the floor. She told me that before she had even seen him on the way back to the house, she felt his presence. She kept looking into the darkness beside the house and feeling like she was being watched. She knew instinctively her children were in harm's way and she needed to get us somewhere else. She didn't question it or blow it off. She listened to her gut, and I'm thankful she did. The feelings she experienced that night were so intense. She never went back to their home again. Friends, always please listen to your instincts and be safe out there. All right, dear listeners, that was the end of these true scary stories. Don't worry, there'll be a longer one coming. I just cut this one short because my voice is about to go out. <laughs> anyway, I would like to take a moment and thank the elite members of Back to Ashes. Anita V, Nat Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Tammy Slayton, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S., Norma D.W., Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for being a, a huge supporter of this channel. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably and my voice is not <laughs> bugging you out too much. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime... Stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. I'm going to go have some tea with honey and get back to recording as soon as my voice is better, okay? <laughs> Peace, love, and light to you all.